So uh, we are here because we have a book. This is the book. It's called Fracture. Um, essays, poems, and stories on fracking in America. And it has a really remarkable lineup of writers. And most remarkable, I think I'll just say that because the other writers aren't here. But the most <laughs> remarkable writer whose name appears on this list is sitting here, Pam Houston. And, yay, yes. And, um, okay, so there are some lesser sorts included here, including <laughs> Patricia Nelson Limerick, she's here, so I don't know what that would have been. But, um, and then we also have one of the co editors. We have Taylor Barbie here this side. And so, um, we have been engaged, the Sydney American West has been engaged for a long time in the hydraulic fracturing um, discussion. And we began in this world in, in 2003 with a publication called What Every Westerner Should Know About Energy, which I feel was unusual in various ways because it did include humor, it did include um, efforts at humanizing various sides and parts of that. And in some ways, this whole enterprise, you could say, has been compensation for the fact that I am one really bad prophet so in the late 1980s and early 1990s, with a whole bunch of people considerably more distinguished than I, including Charles Wilkinson, co-founder of the center, I took part in passing on a, repeatedly a piece of nonsense about how the old West was yielding to the new West. And we all just kind of chanted this as if we had had it revealed to us. And, what, by scripture or something, uh, that the Old West was winding down and the Old West of extraction was going to be, was before our eyes, was being replaced by the New West of tourism, amenity settlement, recreation, so on. And we all just chanted that. It was not set to music, but it should have been. Um, Nathaniel Ridliff was too young to really perform it, so there wasn't really a point in setting any music at that, at that stage. And so we all chanted that, and while we were chanting this stupid set of remarks about this changing economy, the uh, natural gas boom was gearing up as we are all out giving these talks about the end of extractive industry. And we're all giving these talks, and, and the um, hydraulic fracturing technology combines with horizontal drilling in a big way. And, and finally, we've noticed that our talk is really one stupid talk that we're giving about this change. And we had so miscalled this. I did write a quite good limerick about the New West, which is. Um, oh, wait. Um, I should have thought about this. Let me just think for a second here. Um, okay, something is something is true. The West did not didn't grow old; it grew new. Uh, as it got older, it got fresher and bolder. Don't you wish that could happen to you? So it was a pretty good learning. I'm sorry about the first line, which seems to have been lost in there. As I got older, that's what I guess happened with that. So, so as some kind of compensation or uh, route to redemption for my sin of failed prophecy, I did have tried to work as hard as I can to improve the conversation that we are having now with this, um, well, with a, a whole set of interesting complications and tensions from the, the return and resurgence of extractive industry and some wonderful opportunities and benefits as well. So that's how I ended up in this collection. Uh, Taylor contacted me and it's a, um, Impulse move. He's regretted it ever since then, I think, because I'm not exactly in the mainstream in this collection. Um, but then, when have I ever been in the mainstream as well? I wonder about that. So, people, <laughs> there's some very knowledgeable people who've been watching for years and don't get your hopes up. That stream, it's not flowing near you, Patty. Um, so, okay, so there we are. It's a water quality issue in that mainstream, if you think about it. So, what we're going to do here uh, is we're going to have readings from the essays that all of us have written. And I don't know, what do we do? Do we, do we save our most impressive accomplished writer? I will say one of our board members, Susan Kirk, who was a magnificent woman, some of you may have known her, she was the one who sent me, uh, a number of years ago, she, she sent me uh, the, the Cowboys Are My Weakness. And Susan was one great talent scout for me, and that was one I just followed Susan Kirk wherever she wanted to leave me on, on that. So uh, this, but this person is it's right in front of you, but it's such an interesting set of things, how a person could live in Creed and be an English professor at UC Davis. Now, 
most of us are not so good at the teletransport thing, <laughs> and we try, but it doesn't work out very well. So, uh, but what an interesting place she teaches in the Institute of American Indian Arts Low Res MFA program. So, um, well, there's many books, and they're all noteworthy, and they um, occupy central places on our shelves. And here is Pam Houston to read for us. I have a lot of lingers. <laughs> Um, I'm going to stand because those chairs have a swallowing effect, and uh, it might swallow my voice. Um, well, I just wanted to say a couple of things. I'm sure the conversation later will be time to talk about my own personal experience with in the Bakken oil fields and some other experiences I've had personally with fracking sites. Um, but I just wanted to start out by saying when Taylor wrote to me and asked me if I would write the introduction for this anthology, I mean, of course, I was very honored because of the, the very important and wonderful people who are in it, and also some of the people I'd never heard of who wrote beautiful essays. But, but I said yes, even though I had said I wasn't going to say yes to anything because I'm overdue on a book, and sometimes one has to just say no um, all the time. And so I've said no to a lot of things this year. But this was one thing I said yes to, uh, even though it meant taking time away from my overdue book that I'm getting lots and lots of pressure for. And it's because basically I've realized that I don't get up any morning where my first thought isn't sadness about what's happening to this beautiful planet that we live on. And I don't go to bed any night without that being my last thought. And this has only been true in about the last year and a half. But because that is true, for me, and I just have to admit it. I thought, is this because I'm 50? Like, what? why can I not get above this sadness? And I can't, I literally can't get above it. I mean, I, I live my life, lots of good things happen. Um, I have wonderful friends, I have beautiful dogs, I get to go to amazing places. Uh, but that sadness is the main thing now, all the time. And uh, I've never had anything like that before, you know, and so so anything I can do uh, in the name of honoring this amazing planet, even even if it's game over, even if it's game over, like how can I sit with her while she dies? That's sort of my constant question. And teaching at the Institute of American Arts has just given me a place to to express that and to work with that. Um, I've started a conference actually in, in Boulder that's all about writing about the natural world and that helps. So anything I can do that makes me feel like I'm doing something uh, it makes me feel better when I wake up in the morning and when I go to bed at night. So this is the introduction that I wrote for this anthology um, and I think it speaks for itself. It's, it's right here at the front so I don't think it needs much, much ex explanation. It's called Still Enough of the Earth. <clears throat> I live at 9,000 feet on a 120-acre ranch in southwestern Colorado and am a fan of Major League Baseball. My team is the Colorado Rockies, which, if you know anything about baseball, will tell you that I pray to St. Jude Thaddeus, the saint of lost causes. One of the greatest simple pleasures of my summers is coming inside after a day of fence fixing or tree planting or cleaning out the horse trough that was starting to go green with algae and equine slobber, fixing some supper, turning on the game, curling up with the dogs on the couch, and watching the Rockies find some new way to lose. <laughs> this pleasure has been diminished significantly in the last few years because between nearly every inning, before nearly every pitching change, one or another in a series of Big Brother-style commercials sponsored by Coloradoans for Responsible Energy Development comes on TV. Any one of them elevates my blood pressure. But the one that makes me want to take my largest cast iron skillet and hurl it through the center of my aging first generation flat screen television is the one where an ostensible ranch woman, a bit calf-like in her aspect, sits on a fence with her hair blowing in the wind and says, Jason's grandparents built this ranch and we've worked hard to keep it in the family. So we do our best to protect what's ours. The camera pans through a montage of schmaltz, a cowboy herding cattle under a bluebird sky, ranch hands unloading sacks of grain in the slanting sun of a late afternoon, 
The same woman pushing her blonde, blue-eyed daughter on a swing, on, in a tire swing hanging from a hundred-year-old oak tree. With all the stories out there, some people were surprised that we allowed fracking on our land, she continues. And here the camera returns to her on the fence. But we talked with the experts and learned the facts about drilling for oil and natural gas. And guess what? Here she pauses, her last two words ringing in the air in the precise tone of a middle school girl's bathroom bully. It's safe, she continues, smug and more than a little irritated with any of us who are going to tell her it isn't. Safe for our land, our water, and our air. I have seen that commercial maybe 300 times in the last two years, and I still can't decide if the woman is a real rancher or an actress, don't know if the Wrangler shirts with mother of pearl buttons her husband and his friends wear as they toss horseshoes into a pit backlit by a golden sunset came from wardrobe or somebody's actual closet. Don't even know if it is more cynical, more dastardly if the whole commercial was shot in some studio in Culver City with a painted backdrop or not. There is another commercial in the series where a similarly homespun farm woman, one who calls herself an organic goat farmer and who snipes in a simil similarly directed manner, those who would ban fracking ignore our rights and that just gets my goat. She was revealed shortly after the commercial aired to be a 30-year employee of the oil and gas industry, a higher up, managing land acquisition, divestures, and coordinating successful drilling joint ventures, not an organic farmer at all. Oh, it's safe, I find myself almost spitting back at the television way too often to the calf-faced woman alarming the dogs. How great to know! What a lot of time that will save all those scientists recording the deaths of livestock exposed to stream water poisoned by fracking chemicals, the activists investigating the sudden spike in infant mortality in heavily fracked areas like Vernal, Utah, the geologists studying the relationship between fracking and earthquakes in Oklahoma and Kansas. They should have just asked you. But it is easy to be cynical at the edge of the apocalypse, and easier still to let ourselves be brainwashed which is what the corporations who are paying for these 24-7 ads are counting on. It is much harder to wake up in the morning and face the fact that inside more than 82,000 oil and gas wells nationwide, poison is being pumped into the ground and released into the air, and that number is increasing in some areas exponentially. And while cynicism and denial might protect us momentarily, superficially, it is not going to stop the air from filling with dangerous levels of ozone and particulate matter, or stop benzene and formaldehyde from finding its way into our tap water, into our food sources, and into our grocery shelves. The thing that gives me the most hope about the environment these days is when some individual spends the time and energy, risks the blowback and the heartbreak, and risks, in some cases, being run out of town on a rail to reveal the fallacies in the logic handed to us by the billionaires the oil companies, and the policymakers who are on their payroll. The book you hold in your hands contains essays, poems, and stories written by 50 of those people. They are environmental scientists, novelists, ranchers, activists, students, journalists, public servants, sociologists, historians, high school teachers, editors, philosophers, parents, geographers, geologists, archaeologists, lawyers, and organic farmers. And what they all have in common is a need to express themselves on the subject of fracking. Their essays, poems, and stories do what art has been doing since the beginning of time. Take the unbearable and approach it with compassion, give it a face and a form, give it a way to enter our hearts and to change our lives. I will admit up front that for me reading this book wasn't easy. Not because its contents surprised me, but because it confirmed so many of the things I already feared like how deeply in their pockets the oil industry holds the United States government, like how low public health is on their list of priorities, like how much people are willing to destroy because it puts more money in their hands. It's not easy to read about the loss of millions of acres of wildlife-rich land in Northwest Colorado, Wyoming, or North Dakota, to name only a few places, to think about the deer and elk, the coyotes and bears who are drinking the same water that is making the cows stop giving milk, stop giving birth, stop drawing breath. It's not easy to pull up the map of fraccidents, 
spills and accident sites, many of them with multiple fatalities published by Earth Justice, a pox of skull and crossbones spreading from sea to sea. Harder than all of these things, maybe, is to try to reckon with the insidious timing of the fracking boom, that in this absolutely critical moment in the progression of climate change, a moment when we have affordable solar and wind technology at our disposal, we are going to squander the few years and a few billion gallons of drinkable water we have left between us and a full-on environmental disaster. We are going to let a room full of corporate executives hold our foot to the throttle as we send the earth the only home we have careening over a precipice of no way back, just to put a few more dollars in the same pockets that are already stuffed so full of dollars there isn't room for any more. If I didn't know better, I would think fracking was something invented by the Joker or the Riddler, a plan concocted by some cartoonishly evil mind designed to render the citizens of Gotham City utterly unable to help themselves. This magnificent, miraculous, life-giving, and life-sustaining planet wasn't even mapped properly a couple of hundred years ago, and now we are on the eve of its destruction at our hands. For me, that is the most terrible, the most painful in my entire repertoire of self-torturing thoughts. But I grew up in hard circumstances, and it was the beauty and the bounty of the earth that saved me from despair. I will not turn away from her now out of sorrow or frustration or helplessness or out of some misguided notion that if I abandon all hope, it will protect me from some bigger pain later. The earth isn't dead yet, and neither are we. And self-torture, even grief, is its own brand of narcissism. The authors in this anthology stared down their sorrow and their fears, faced the difficult facts, and made art out of them. Collectively, they have created a kind of love song to the earth. <coughs> like all the best music, it is fiery, mournful, wistful, heartbroken, hopeful, and full of a complicated and hard-won love. A little over a year ago, I started making it a priority to walk five miles a day, wherever I found myself, whatever else the day had in store. I bought a Fitbit to keep myself honest in this pursuit and have walked, it tells me, 3,113 miles since I first put it in my pocket. One of the many things my walking practice has revealed to me is that right now, in 2015, there is on the earth a heck of a lot of magnificence left, beauty worth seeing, worth saving, worth fighting for with everything we've got. In the past several weeks alone, I have walked in the high meadows near my home in Creed, Colorado, and seen, because of this weirdly rainy summer, the most glorious display of Indian paintbrush, blue phlox, silvery lupin, and scarlet helia that I have seen in 25 years of living here. I have walked in the desert south of Santa Fe with thunderstorms in three directions, lightning writing what looked for all the world like sentences across the sky. I have walked across the breakwater in Provincetown, Massachusetts under a full moon and seen the bioluminescence rushing under the rocks, lighting the sea like some kind of disco for crustaceans. On these walks, I have had personal, I would go so far as to say meaningful, encounters with many animals. An elk calf, some spotty mule deer twins, a bald eagle, a great blue heron, several coyotes, and about a million cottontails. I have stood on a cliff in Big Sur and counted 20 whales and hundreds of dolphins beyond the kelp beds, seals and cormorants a thousand feet above me. I have kayaked off Lopez Island in Washington State and spent an hour in some sort of communication with a curious harbor seal. And I have paddle boarded in the Puget Sound over a jellyfish whose body was more massive than my torso and whose tentacles, if fully extended, would reach beyond two lengths of me. Last September, I had the once in 100 lifetimes good fortune of crossing paths with six to 800 narwhal as they made their way south along the coast of Bylot Island to their winter waters far offshore in Baffin Bay. I know I am beyond lucky that my occupation takes me to all of these places and that my actual job, and by that I mean the thing I get paid for, begins with bearing witness to them. But when I am in those places, I can't help wishing that the CEO of Royal Dutch Shell was standing beside me. Can't help wondering how long it has been since he took a walk in the wilderness, how long it has been since he slept on the ground. Surely, I think, if he were here, he would understand the intrinsic value of those narwhal, or the elk calf, or the Indian paintbrush. Surely he would want his children and grandchildren to be able to see them to have air to breathe and water to drink and a stable planet to put their feet on. 
I don't imagine the CEO of Royal Dutch Shell will read this book, but if he did, I would like to believe that he is still enough of this earth that it might give him pause for thought. For the rest of us, these essays, poems, and stories will help us to be smarter and more compassionate than the lies that are designed to pacify us, to keep us silent. The words of these writers will help us act with hope and resolve. So our next speaker, or reader, and by the way, we'll each read a bit, and then we'll have a chat among ourselves, and then um, I can have time for a few questions from you guys as well. So our next speaker is a person who, with his co-editor, rallied us to this cause, or not to, this, to the cause of writing the book. I was not quite rallied to the cause that was just here, here but I was, I'm always interested in causes. Um, and so, he, this is Taylor Barbie, and he received his MA in Liberal Studies from Hamline University in 2013. He's currently pursuing his MFA in Creative Writing and Environment at Iowa State University. And I will just say, as a point of transition here, that I spend a lot of time in, area, in rooms where people are talking about natural resource issues, and they are talking about uh, the future of natural resource development, and it's, there's just inherent comedy in the room because everybody in those conversations is 50 years old or over. Just a pattern. And woohoo, the future. <laughs> We've got a future here in a way that is uh, rarely present in many of those conversations. And I, I actually think there are moments where the ancient folks look around the room and think if we're talking about the future, we better have one of the people who will be around in the future. So we don't know. Medical science progresses all the time. So we can be there. So here's, here's him. Thank you, Patty. I'm just going to circle around up here um, have a little bit of a stable platform. Um, first, thank you for taking part of your Thursday to come out. It was a lovely flight into Denver today to see mountains, which um, my home area is western North Dakota, so your mountains gave me my badlands. The dust and rubble of the Rockies are the beautiful badlands of western North Dakota. And it, it must be known that my dream in helping bring about this book, my selfish dream was only to get to the center of the American West. Um, I first encountered Patty's work in undergraduate, her wonderful essay, Dancing with Professors, which I have my own <coughs> students read, and Pam Houston's short stories have just been bedrock. So to get to spend an evening with these two women who have just been beacons for me is quite a gift. Um, but I'm going to be subversive, as I like to do, and you know, disregard what Patty said I was going to do. Um, since I edited this, I'm going to read not my own work and select two other pieces to give you sort of the scope of this. They're brief. This is after Pam's introduction and after Barbara Hurd's uh, frontis piece called Fracking a Fable. Um, this is the piece that formally begins the collection. And if you can believe it, it wasn't even a solicited piece. It came across my email. I started reading the first sentence. Then I started reading it out loud. And then I screamed, oh, goody, out loud. Um, 318 words are about to hit you. So we'll see where you are by the end of it. It's called Seduction by Mary Heather Noble. It's a bit like adolescence all this newfound attention that you think you understand, and the young man sitting on your, flowered, your mother's flowered couch is polite and respectful in a way that she'd sworn had gone extinct, talking about your future and security and the wealth of opportunities to come. And though you barely even know him, you can't help but feel a little taken with his outsider accent, his pressed polo shirt with the company logo over his heart, the way he folds his long fingers around your mother's chipped coffee mug as the steam from the brew rises and dances around his lips, which keep moving and assuring you that it will be safe and think of the potential of this place. He uses noble words like exploration and independence and speaks of recovery in a way that means returning to normal or a healthy state of being. 
as if the way you've been living here is neither of these things. He speaks of recovery, as in returning something to its rightful owner, which is you and your family. Of course you want what's yours. You'll remember those moving lips when the trucks come rumbling in hour after hour again and again, and the midnight light from the drill pad trespasses through your drawn bedroom curtains, the clanging and pounding invading the silence of your room. You'll remember those promises as you try to ignore the chemical veil and swallow the anxiety of what could be seeping into your well. Of course you want what's yours, but you won't know what they are taking when you unlock the gate and let them in, forcing and drilling, injecting God knows what into God knows where. And you'll think you are doing this for your future, think you're doing this out of love. But what do you know of love except for your mother's palm olive hands and the dance of willows before a storm? A clean glass of water, the crescendo of cicada in the afternoon, the smell of wildflower dew. You'll be fooled by the softness of what they promise in the beginning, the f -f finesse, but shocked by the unexpected violence of a frack. There's a persistent sting to innocence loss, a trace of diesel in the air. I'm going to take a little water break. I have to say too, just a quick story, and maybe this will happen during Q&A too, but this book really came about, um, if you know the writer Alexander Chi, he had Annie Dillard at Wesleyan, and she apparently would tell her students each time they go into a bookstore, go up to your section, put your hand where your name would be, and do this every time until those books start coming. And I'm, you know, I'm kind of a dim human being and dense, and so I, you know, I'm kind of lazy, so I thought what better gift than getting to work with wonderful people on an anthology, partly because I was so damn shocked that a book like this didn't exist. I could write my own book about fracking if I would like, but what a gift to be part of a choir of 50 writers. Um, so I hope as you sit with this book in the future, if you haven't already, um, you just listen to that choir singing. Um, since she can't be here, I'm going to shamelessly plug my co-editor um, and speak for her. It's um, it's sort of a ironic. It's a it's a funny piece if you're into this type of humor. So we'll we'll see if you're into this type of humor. It's a segmented essay in ten parts uh, by Stephanie Brooke Trout. It's called Hear No Evil. We don't want to hear about fracking simply because we don't like the language. It's unpleasant to hear about pump jacks and fracking fluid. It's distasteful. Frankly, it's too sexual, and not in the shiny, symmetrical, and airbrush kind of way that breaks the internet, in the vulgar way that focuses on the parts of fucking we don't want to think about, the sweaty, furious pumping, the fluid staining the bed sheets, the way we turn into animals, the hunger, the vulnerability, we like sex, but we don't like to think about the mess that it creates. Two, we don't want to hear about fracking because we don't like how the language makes us think of, just for a moment, non-consensual sex. We don't even like to say the word rape. We don't like talking about real rape, much less metaphorical rape. We try to define rape to rank it from worst to least bad. We're trying to figure out what rape is legitimate and who was asking for it. We try to joke about rape or to laugh at jokes about rape because we don't want anyone to think we can't take a good rape joke. And the parallel is too far a stretch anyway. Hyperbolic. The land can't give consent, so it can't not give consent. And if it could give consent, it probably would. It's given us everything else we ever wanted from it. Three. 
We don't want to hear about fracking because it's not in our backyard. We don't want pump jacks on our land. We don't want fracking fluids in our watershed. We don't want to drink the contaminated water flaming out of the faucet. But as long as it's somewhere else, hidden somewhere that we don't have to see it, then we love fracking. Fracking means jobs. Fracking means energy independence. Fracking means bridge fuel. Fracking means we don't have to make sacrifices. We don't have to change a thing. Fracking is the future, as long as it's not in our backyard. In fact, why not do it somewhere we've already written off, like North Dakota? Hell, it might even make the place a little bit better. Four. We don't want to hear about fracking because it's just one more thing for the environmentalists to gripe about. The environmentalists always need something to gripe about. And if it weren't this, it would be something else. We're tired of the griping. We're tired of the debate. We're tired of being asked to choose between the wasty ways we love so much and the future. We're tired of being made to feel ashamed when we refuse to do anything. This is your battle, not ours. We have other things to worry about. Job security, a second mortgage, finding a leak at the bottom of our swimming pool. We don't care much for politics. We vote, we're good citizens. But after the results are in, we don't want to worry about what's good or bad for the future. We work hard and we deserve to live without worry. At the end of the day, we want to drink margaritas and grill hot dogs and water our lawns with underground sprinklers. It's not our job to worry about fracking. And if it's your job to worry about fracking, then keep me out of it. Better yet, get a real job. We hear Halliburton is hiring. Five. We don't want to hear about fracking because we don't like your alternative. If the solution could somehow be linked to consumerism, if we could do the things we love without fracking, we might be more inclined to listen. But you are asking too much. Your valuation of the future is too high. Six. We don't want to hear about fracking because gas prices are down and we are happy. We remember $4 a gallon. We remember austerity. We had to trade in for a more fuel-efficient SUV. But now we can fill up our yachts and jet skis and run the AC while heating the pool all summer long. Did you hear us? We're happy. How dare you damn fractivists try to take that away from us? Seven. We don't want to hear about fracking because it's been going on for decades and what's the big deal anyway? We don't care about the difference between vertical and horizontal drilling. The fossil fuels are there for the taking. We'd be fools to squander them. If we contaminate our fresh water, then we'll just buy bottled. And the increased demand for bottled water will create jobs. Win-win. Eight. We don't want to hear about fracking because we hear two different sets of facts and we don't want to have to think critically to get our own answers. We don't know whom to trust, so we don't trust anyone. But we'll take the cheap energy, put it on the futures tab. Nine. We don't want to hear about fracking because it's time Chicken Little buttoned his beak. You always say the sky is falling, as, as far as we can tell, the sky is still there. We know there are several different endings to the Chicken Little folktale, and we choose to believe the ending we want. We choose to hear whatever supports the status quo. If that means we get eaten by a fox or that the sky really collapses on our heads, there's nothing we could do about it anyway. It's too late. We might as well enjoy the time we have left. Ten. We don't want to hear about fracking because we know it's only a matter of time before it rips our world apart. And when it does, we want to be able to say, we didn't know and actually mean it. How dare you try to make us liars by forcing us to see the truth before we're ready. We are never ready. Uh, that was an interesting metaphor of the choir. And if this is a choir, then I will be removed from that choir um, for the dissonance of my voice here. The book does have the body, it's interesting you said choir, because there is something of the preaching to the choir quality, and I don't know how the choir would fill it up, this particular essay. Here is my, I'm going to read a few snippets from it, Hydraulic Fracturing, a guide to the terrain of public conversation, you have the newest high country news out there available to you, 
and that has a version of this essay and some additional parts in it. So I'll just show you how poorly my voice fits in the quiet I guess. Uh, imagine two people with opposite views on hydraulic fracturing who are taking part in a calm, open, respectful, and productive discussion. If sketching this congenial scenario has not already stretched imagination beyond its snapping point, then imagine a conclusion of the conversation in which both of these participants say to each other, I am not entirely in agreement with you, but what I have heard you say has caused me to question some of the assumptions and convictions I held. If a reporter came upon this scene, the rarity of this event should earn featured headlines. And here is the sample headline, Entrenched hydraulic fracturing opponents converse without distress, arriving at better understanding of the issue and each other. <laughs> Don't accept that. Um, so here is my, well, I'll just read a little bit more of this. Uh, in terms of my, much of the essay is about why I do not find the two sides characterization that there are two sides to this issue. And so here's a couple of passages on why I don't find that um, accurate or helpful. First, and often pushed to the side of attention, there is a very sizable sector of opinion that is barely visible and nearly inaudible. Citizens in this sector have not made up their minds, so many of them have, may hover in the vicinity of the mild-mannered view that hydraulic fracturing is a technique that offers great promise, but needs to be regulated carefully. They may, for instance, find more cheer than gloom in the news that our American nation turns out to have enormous holdings in oil and gas that were barely noticed until recent years. Even as they acknowledge that the recent hand, hand, excuse me, the responsible handling of this unexpected fortune comes with a crucial challenge and responsible stewardship, people in this sector, the ones in the middle trying to make up their minds, do not organize themselves into associations, convene rallies, gather signatures for ballot initiatives, buy advertisements, put out position papers, or hire attorneys to file lawsuits in support of their interests. But this population, which may well be the vast majority, is itself divided into several subcategories. Some are indifferent, some are bored, some are intimidated by an issue that seems so technical, and many are preoccupied with more urgent and immediate life challenges. Still, in a conviction arising from many conversations, U.S. citizens struggling to find intelligible meaning in the collision of contradictory assertions in the public sphere are the largest group of all. And second, the categories of social class and of race receive very sparse recognition in the conventional casting of the participants in the controversy over hydraulic fracturing and natural gas development. To put this clumsily, most of the people who are taking clearly defined stances of opposition on hydraulic fracturing are white and middle or upper class. Figuring out the positions of working class and or poor people is at this point an enterprise close to guesswork. So there's uh, a section then on how, how many differences there are within the category called fossil fuel industry. And uh, I'll just finish this the one uh, passage, one paragraph here. Of all these distinctions and divisions, the toughest to address is the difference between good operators and not so good operators. As in every profession, variations in human character and judgment can make a big difference in performance. And as in many other professions, a good player has no obvious mechanism or procedure for asking that his rivals meet his standards of good performance, even though the reputations of all countries will suffer from the the careless or improvident behavior of one company. Okay, then there's a section on the non-industry groups and how diverse their motivations are. And uh, now I just want a couple more passages and then I'll, we'll get into the chatting mode. And then there are the workers. Jobs in natural gas development pay well. This is especially true for people without college degrees who otherwise face a dismal set of opportunities in a post-industrial America. And yet the workers also face the highest risk of injury or, depending on the safety of operations at particular sites, of exposure to toxic substances as well as susceptibility to silicosis from inhaling the sand kept on site for use as the propent in hydraulic fracturing fluid. Because the workers are often transitory newcomers, interactions between them and long-term residents concerned about natural gas development can be tense or even hostile. While established residents in proximity to rigs and wells may express interest in workers because observations of their health could reveal risks that the nearby residents in proximity will face, the social distance between workers and established residents is itself an unsettling aspect of the industry's presence. 
Near Meade, Colorado, in November of 2014, in a very cold spell, workers tried to thaw a pipe at a well site. When the pipe broke at high pressure, it killed one worker and injured two others. Information about the worker who died was sketchy. Newspaper articles simply said he had been identified as, quote, Michael Smith, 36. Had the person killed in this explosion been a nearby resident or had he been an executive of an oil and gas company, it seems certain that we would have learned a lot more about him. Instead, the dimensions and dynamics of his life remain beneath the surface of our attention. If we were to try to return to the model of two sides to hydraulic fracturing, it would not be an easy matter to figure out where to place Matthew Smith, 36. Okay, then the last uncomfortable passage here about the uh, complicated history of, of the industry and of uh, suburban residents along the Front Range. The oil and gas industry inherits the complicated history of Western extractive industry. The extraction of natural resources, gold, silver, coal, oil, timber, grass, water, soil, nutrients, drove American expansion into the West. Extraction also left behind many messes. Abandoned mines leaking acid drainage into waterways and open pit mines evolving into toxic lakes, clear-cut forest lands, eroded soil, ghost towns stranded when bus followed booms. Today, when an energy company puts forward a plan to drill for oil and gas, this legacy of disturbance, often uncorrected or even unnoticed by those who produced it, returns for a reckoning. In many people's minds, the natural gas industry gets easily cast as the latest villain in this long history of extractive companies racing to capture resources and making a quick departure without remedy, repair, or cleanup of what they left in their way. Even though there has been a revolution in federal, state, and local regulatory power concerning the conduct of extractive industries, the memory of the damage done by extraction is sharp and lasting. And so history has put a premium on the willingness of industry leaders to recognize that fair or not, they inherit the legacy of Western extractive industry and that accordingly they must take every possible precaution to avoid replicating the injuries of the past. Meanwhile, the residents of Colorado's front range towns and suburbs move through the present with an awkward historical legacy of their own. A number of these communities originated as coal mining towns. Occasionally, within their town limits, an abandoned mine undergoes subsidence and a road or structure slumps into the ground. More to the point, these towns were nodes of a burst of residential expansion after World War II. These communities would never have grown to anything close to their current size without a festival of combustion of fossil fuels, a festival that continues apace today. Commuting to and from the city of Denver became more and more viable with highways, abundant gasoline, and widespread automobile ownership. Just a few decades ago, sprawl, the rapid expansion of the population of these com communities, a movement driven in part by white flight from urban desegregation, was the principal focus of alarm among conservationists and environmentalists who were concerned about traffic congestion, smog, the disruption of wildlife habitat by housing patterns that reject to density, and the celebration of consumerism that characterized suburbs nationwide. The history provides awkward footing for front range residents who would like to position themselves today on the environmental high ground. So, the concluding uh, paragraph here. In wilder moments of imagining roots out of our current stalemate, I dream, I dream of a custom in which public meetings on a controversial subject like hydraulic fracturing universally begin with a statement along these lines. Post statement. We cannot plan for our future until we face up to our history and directly acknowledge the complexity of our own moment in time. And if that quotation, if that statement seems too prosaic and pedestrian, then here are two quotations to get conversations off to a promising start. And I seem to have put these quotations in the wrong order, so I'll reverse them. This is a, a, a poet, A.E. Stallings, who's quite a wonderful poet, a poem, Jigsaw Puzzle. Slowly you restore the fractured world and start to recreate the afternoon before it fell apart. And then the concluding quotation from Romans 3.23 that I would like to have read at public meetings. There is no distinction for all who sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's it. Yeah. So, uh, my stance is somewhat 
different, and we'll get to that, I imagine. And uh, vexation and irritation can be expressed about my stance. That's been a long time exercise, civil right in the United States for people to express their dismay over my thoughts. But I'm wondering if we could start off together by asking you what your goals and purposes and aspirations and ambitions were in, the, in planning the book, how you chose authors, did you give instructions or request to authors, is the like-mindedness of this book something you intended or is that something that just happened? Well, Patty was the first one I solicited from, and when Patricia Limerick says yes, everyone else wants to come to the party. <laughs> yeah, that's, say, that's not uh, the custom in Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I guess for me, um, it largely was a selfish endeavor, if I'm being honest, as most writing probably is, and then we hope to be idealistic and say it's going to do some good in the world. Um, but I've spent much of my writing life living in the Bach and oil boom. It's where I spend my summers. Um, Maybe tell them about your essay just very quickly. Sure. So my essay, and this will be, I have a collection of essays coming out about a year and a half from now. And in North Dakota, there are these 18 geological and man-made features, what the state has designated the extraordinary places. Now you might be saying there are 18 in North Dakota, and I would say there are more than 18 in North Dakota. Uh, but one of them, the one that is in this collection, is the state's highest point, 3,205 feet, um, White Butte, um, which I've climbed numerous times. Um, but it's a place that we drove by on our way to Gillette, Wyoming, where I have family in childhood, and I sort of tell the story of doing that in childhood and this connection to this landmark, this time mark, before you could tell time, we have two hours left, three hours left, whatever. Um, but then going back there as an adult, and the oil boom has not yet surrounded this. You actually cannot see pump jacks from the top of it. Um, but it's sort of a meditation, I would say, about what that looks like about at the time that it was written to think if the boom is going to continue progressing, what does protection look like of these places um, that are very dear to us. So part of my own writing of that, I think, is an attempt to get other people who are reading to say, I have a place that's special to me, like this place. It might not be in North Dakota, but what does that mean to be of a place and have that place be of you? Um, so this, this anthology really came out sort of as a, a cry because we, many of us in this room know um, Josh Fox, we know Sandra Steingraber, we know people out east. Um, we must admit the middle corridor of the country, Texas, Oklahoma, the Dakotas, no one really cares about. Um, some people care about Colorado, but not really Utah, not really Wyoming. Um, and part of me, really wanted help. I mean, what Pam had bore witness to of going tonight with grief. And I have lived in a part of the world that looks like, to borrow another biblical image, um, the lake of fire is what North Dakota looks like at night. When the sun sets, the horizon dances from the flaring of natural gas. You can see it from outer space. And I mainly wanted people to come together. And so some people, like Patty, like Pam, Rick Bass, David Gessner, um, I would reach out to it. And it's shocking. These people would say yes to you. You know, people that are like bedrock authors for you, um, whose work you turn to, actually would say yes to you. And that was such a humbling moment. The other side of that was Stephanie and I created an open call for submissions and sent it around to hundreds of creative writing, um, largely actually environmental studies programs, because most creative writers <coughs> do a different type of writing than environmentally focused. Um, but we got a wonderful selection. So in here we have established voices and emerging voices, which feels great. Some people, this is their first publication, and that feels like such a gift. The uh, rallying the troops, preaching to the choir thing is pretty darn conspicuous. <laughs> and, uh, and, that's, and that's a total First Amendment right. So I'm not saying what a thing that you yeah. exercise free speech. I think that's, yeah. that's good. That's fine. Yeah. 
But I wonder about its persuasiveness because that, it, I mean, the phrase preaching to the choir is an interesting thing. It could be that if you preach with such fervor, the choir gives up. The choir just says this is, because there is fatalism in gloom. If you were taking such a, a stance of um, grief and despair, the next state, the next train stop, if we could use an industrial metaphor, from grief and, and gloom is fatalism and resignation and um, and a sense of, when you say eve of destruction, when you say those kinds of phrases, Barry McGuire saying the song eve of destruction, it's an interesting phrase. So I just, I wonder if you both could reflect on, and I'm going to frame this, if you imagine this as volume one, in which the like-minded rally with an irritating person named Tyler Priest, who writes, a, he's a historian, he writes as irritatingly as I do, and so you have volume one in which the like-minded join together and and feel comforted from that. Mm -hmm. And then volume two, where you think, what if we really wanted that, that Shell CEO to be involved? Or what if we wanted someone who was, who was related to Shell CEO people? Or what if we wanted somebody who was in what I think is the great majority of people trying to make up their minds? What if we just wanted them to think if we didn't necessarily expect to have them come into our congregation and join us in our belief system. Is there a volume two where you are less embracing of the polarization and opposition and my way or either or will either go to hell or will take my suggestions and will be in paradise again? I mean, is there a way to, to uh, imagine volume two or are you completely contented with having a Rally the troops. Um, so okay, so Pam, and feel free. <laughs> well, I was just over here. Uh, but, but feel free to express vexation with anything that you have heard from me and on the senior. Or the other. Um, gosh, Patty, I, um, you know, from the beginning of environmental writing, um, you know, I don't believe that that it is necessarily a goal of environmental writing to to um, to represent all sides equally you know uh, I mean if you think of the great environmental if you think of silent spring you know if you think of um, Edward Abbey's writing if you think of Stegner's writing if you think of um, David Gessner's writing you know if you think of Terry Tempest Williams writing if you think of the great environmental writers of all you know in, in, in the history of literature you know they're not putting out books that 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 fairly. I, I, I mean, I, I'm I'm uncomfortable using the language, but who 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 show the other side of what they're trying to the, the call to action that they're trying to provide. I don't know if you have more responsibility to do that in an anthology where there's so many voices come together. Um, you know, for me, you know, I was presented with this book when it was finished. And I wrote the introduction that I wrote to this book, <laughs> which was a which was a kind of a sobbing, you know, about the Bakken and about other places. I've been to the Bakken, and and it was one of the more powerful experiences of my life to see what has happened to North Dakota. So, so for me, um, I didn't I didn't for one minute say, oh, I wish this was a more fair and balanced view. You know, I, there's plenty of um, there's plenty of like, those commercials which run 24/7. There are plenty of people from the other side. Those commercials make an attempt to sound fair and balanced, um, especially the new ones that have the little hiking girls who chose choose to work in the oil and gas industry. You know, so so I don't know. I mean, a volume two could be interesting if that were someone's goal, but I'm not sure that's the goal of this book. I think there are a lot of people, and I think that. That essay by Stephanie Brooktrout stated really so clearly what so many of my students, so many of my friends even, you know, are like, I can't even think about this. I can't look at it because, because it's because it, it's ugly. It's about rape and it's about, you know, like it, it like just all that stuff. I thought that essay was so great, and I remembered reading it the first time. But I, but there's so many people who want to look away, and, and I don't know. I don't honestly know. I'm going to stop talking a second, but I finally came to something I actually want to say. I, I don't know how to be an environmentalist 
at the eve of disaster. But I'm trying to learn, you know. Um, I don't think it's about being positive. <laughs> I, think, I think we're kind of done with that. I think, I think it's about uh, accepting where we are and, and singing about the earth that we love, even if it's in its death throes. I don't know how to spin that positively. I, the, the book that I'm overdue on and working on every day is a book about the 120 acres I live on. And um, I think my editor wanted me to write a book, you know, girl from New Jersey comes to Colorado, buys a ranch, freezes pipes, hilarity ensues. And what I have wound up writing is a very, very different book, which is this kind of love song to the, the earth that, that saved me, that saved me from my childhood, that, that became my mother and father, you know. Um, and, and it's hard to know in this book exactly what you're asking. It's hard to know how to, how to mourn and still be hopeful and how much of each, um, how to be angry and still try to trust. I mean, everything, every time, the whole time you were reading, every word you read, I thought, oh God, I hope that's true. I mean, I, I hope it's true that there are good oil and gas companies, and I hope it's true that some of them care, and I hope it's true, I want that to be true more than anything. I don't want them all to be crooked and, and unconscious, you know? I would love it if that's true, what you said, the whole time you were reading. So, I mean, I'm, you know, I, I, an environmental scientist said to me recently, um, you know, I, I feel, you know, that the future of the Earth in the 100-year frame is extremely grim. But in the 500-year frame, I feel pretty good about it. And he said, there won't be many people left, but the ones who are here will have learned a lot. And I took tremendous hope and relief in that, you know. So that's, that's where I am. And, and so to me, you know, this is a little, this is a little cry. <laughs> this is like a little, a little sob, you know, in the face of a bulldozer, a giant machine. So I don't, like, I don't see it the way you do. You know, I don't feel like, oh, we got to give those oil and gas guys a fair shot in the book. Because this feels like a daisy that's being run over by a steamroller, you know? Um, but, you know, that's, that's where I live, and that's how I see the world, and that's how I, how, how I experienced the Bakken, and how I was just up in, um, you know, the, the Great Bear Wilderness during all the, the LNG protests up there. And, you know, those aren't white people. Those aren't middle-class white people. Those are the, the First Nation tribes who are fighting to save their way of life and fighting really hard and actually at this moment winning. Uh, briefly, momentarily, um, and you know, I don't, I, 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 I don't see, um, I don't see, I don't see a fair fight from their end. So the fact that there's this little sob out in the world seems like, yeah, I mean, yeah. What for someone who didn't have anything to say? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh. I have uh, maybe three things I want to say, which is that on um, indigenous people, there are tribes, Southern Ute being conspicuous, that has done a remarkable job in developing a resource and um, investing for the long term in a permanent fund and so on. So to say that there is one approach to indigenous resource development, uh, that we must stall those of us who are not Indians should support, that's a little bit complicated because a lot of paternalism comes into play when, when white folks say, oh no, you mustn't touch your, your land in that manner. But that's but, not what's happening. In the I understand that. I understand that. There's a range. But, but to, I guess that's my point, is overgeneralization is overgeneralization. And to say, for me to say, the Southern youths, that represents the, mm -hmm. the stance that we should take. That would be silly because that's what overgeneralization. So that's what I think this book is one, I guess I'm not um, necessarily so concerned about whether you got the, if you read the introduction and said, well, there's a good idea, we'll get the Shell CEO to contribute an essay. We'll do that. I'm not <laughs> saying that's what would be the. That would have been so cool. <laughs> it would have been. I've heard, I don't think we're going to get Tony Hayward, I don't think we want him. So the, the BP CEO was an interesting public figure because. Mm -hmm. 
when do I get my life back for heaven's sake? Um, Crin, I find those ads quite lame. I, I find those to be, um, when you fight with the cred ads, I think that's not really even interesting to take on a cred ad. I don't find those convincing. I never have found them convincing because I don't think they're very well thought out as a form of, of communication. I'm not sure this is well thought out as a form of communication either. So here, now I compare you to a cred ad. This is really fun. What am I seeing here? This is so hard. So, um, so I wonder about several things. I wonder what it would take I do believe that there are very responsible oil and gas producers, and I believe there are terrible oil and gas producers. And I wonder, I don't think my asserting my conviction is really a very interesting act. So I wonder, what would it take for me to provide you with evidence that I have not drunk the Kool-Aid, as the phrase goes, that I haven't just been uh, snookered oh, or suckered? I, oh, you have a lot of Oh, I do. Yeah. Um, I don't... Like I said, I I would love to believe. <laughs> well, then how do okay? Then let me help you. Okay. How shall I help you believe? Um, well, I, I don't know how you can. I mean, I I I was, you know, because I have seen so many so much evidence to the contrary. But but I'm not unwilling to believe, mm -hmm. and I absolutely believe that there might be a good one. But then how do we let them be yeah. the ones who are yeah. fracking? Because it's the bad ones who have all the money. The regulation issues are, I'm not sure if the bad ones have all the money because in fact, the larger companies are often better set up to take precautions and to invest in that. So it's a complicated world. Yeah. But I we're going to invite everyone on the Patty and Pam tour bus. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, out. I believe that. But you know, I, I have friends who, who did just what you said, you know, who weren't making it in California financially and went to the Bakken to make enough money so that they could retire and you know, because because otherwise they were making it, and you know the the all of the ways that they were not protecting their workers uh, are were astonishing to me. Like it was so much worse than I thought it was even gonna be in terms of the sleeves and the count and the and they don't and they just dump them in somebody's yard. I mean. And this was a guy who wanted more than anything to drink the Kool-Aid because he decided he was gonna he was gonna earn, make a living for his family. He was gonna support his family. They were gonna get back on their feet. So he wanted more than anything to drink the Kool-Aid. And and day by day he was not being protected. The the wells were not being protected. The land was not being protected. And he's not one of us. <laughs> he's not me or Taylor. He's a guy who went there to, to, to believe in it and to be able to do it for a while. And the difference between us is that I am um, in the world where there is a lot of variation. Yeah. So if you tell me that there have been irresponsible producers who put their mm -hmm. workers at risk, I don't have any, mm -hmm. I think, yeah. I went to the Powder River Basin years ago and took a tour where I saw uh, oil dripping on the ground, not produced oil, but just poorly maintained. Yep. Machinery and I and I was with the people who said, "Well, we'll call that in one more time." So I, I know that, mm -hmm. but your position seems uh, maybe easier and maybe well, just a little bit beyond my fat because you have to take the opposite stance that there is no the, there is no variation. There's only no. I, I, no. Well, I, then, well, then join me on the uh, Pam and Patty bus tour here where we go. Okay. Okay. Good. So we right. did that. I, no, I'm not saying there's no, there's no variation. I, I'm saying if. If the reg, if who's ever regulating it isn't doing their job, which clearly they aren't in the bucket, then, how, then, then what good does it do if there's a, a couple of good producers out there, or even if half of the producers are good? What good does it do if all these terrible things are happening to people and livestock and water systems, if if only 50% are following the regulations? Then we might well on our tour go see some places where the regulations. And where, in fact, companies may have chosen to exceed the regulations with some best No, we should. we should. We should do that. <laughs> should and then the that. other thing that I will just put between us here is that you have uh, a level of certainty that is not consonant with public health research and science. And that's fine. Public health research and science is about probabilities for the very good reason that you cannot put a human population in proximity to a hazard or possible hazard and keep them there for 25 years and have them get medical checkups and tell them not to move around. I mean, it's a very difficult 
science. I feel for the public health people because it's really hard to do the kind of thing you could do in a laboratory. It's, it's not done. So what you have are probabilities. And you have, um, oftentimes in public health studies, you have an observed correlation where something seems to be happening and it seems to be happening in relationship to that. And it is very easy to jump from the probabilities and the correlation to assertions of causation which put in a level of certainty that, in fact, is not there. So I find this a remarkably um, certain book in a way that is peculiar in a field where there's not much certainty. Now, you could say that the benefit of the doubt must be on one side or the other, but the, the conclusiveness and certainty exceeds what I would agree with that. Oh, uh, I mean, uh, oh, we just agreed. So, so, some, we just some of That's the right. essays in here seem um, very certain. Mm -hmm. And and maybe you think mine does too, but 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> several of the essays in here seemed very certain in a way that surprised me, and I was like, wow, I wonder how, why he's so certain. Mm -hmm. um, but but if you watch the news, as I do, and you see what's happening in Flint, Michigan, and you see you, you see just case after case, and the guy who won't make the drugs cheap, like you see case after case after case after case, where the 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 where public policy has not protected the system. But this, but we're back to overgeneralization because absolutely Flint, absolutely, and then hundreds of really functioning urban water systems where they're testing water quality relentlessly. So I just don't, I just don't get the part where you take the bad cases and move them and spread them all around. And then I'm going to quote from the noted uh, African American law professor from Yale. Law school, Stephen L. Carter, who was writing about Anthony Scalia's death, and he said, um, Stephen Carter, who did not agree with Scalia much, I never failed to learn from his wonderfully crafted opinions. The need to counter his arguments made mine better. So here's his, I listened, I read it, I took it in, because it sharpened my mind to listen attentively to the other, and on some issues, Scalia's opinion converted me to his cause. Shall we condemn Stephen Carter for his mushy headedness there? Shall we? No. no. But we... what have I said that would make you think I would? <laughs> Patty, can I comment? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I just, I just want to lift something up, though. I think we're falling into a bit of a, a bit of a trench here. The anthology is literature, though, as well. Oh, I mean, it's it, it's different than historical research or sociological research. Though these elements come in. A poem is a poem. I mean, these are exceedingly political things, but I would argue when Milton wrote Paradise Lost, that was a political act. I mean, that was going against received wisdom of the church. So just to speak broadly, not in sort of, I mean, we can, we can wrangle, and I'll give you facts and statistics as the day is long about mismanagement in western North Dakota, the Bakken. I saw you ask where that region is. So the Bakken is the shale play in western North Dakota, eastern Montana, and southern Saskatchewan, just so you know my, I don't like using jargon, so I want to bring you in. Um, but the idea to me is we need stories to live into. I think all three of us would agree with that. And I think what I hope the anthology does is offer up particular perspectives. I would say my work as an editor, editor, though we fact-checked certain cases, and Tyler Priest is a notable one, because one study he uh, quoted in his essay actually was reversed this summer when we were going into publication mode. And we had to quickly bring that essay up to speed. Um, the idea of literature, to my mind, where I take my cue is in William Kittredge, you know, the noted Montana writer. Each night, we go to bed and tell ourselves stories. You know, while we're sleeping, we listen to these stories. We get up and we live in these stories. They form the structure of our lives. That's what much of this anthology, I would say, does. This is reality for many people. Now, that might mean there is another reality out there. There's the reality of making back your retirement account, of saying, thank goodness, the oil booms have happened because we can now retire. And I would just lift up the idea of what cost. Because I think to Pam's earlier comments, what I think we have seen from fracking, now Patty, I'm going to raise your hackles, 
is that the supposed free market is not so free. By which I mean... My hackles are fine. <laughs> well, I just want to say that when faced with an industry that has the noose tightening around one's neck, by which I mean a year ago in January when an oil pipeline burst under the Yellowstone River at Glendive, Montana, and the 6,000 residents there could not drink their water for well over a week because it has a known cancer-causing agent, I want to call foul on that, a 50-year-old pipeline. All pipelines will become 50 years old. Right now in Iowa, we face the same thing, a slated pipeline that would cross from North Dakota through South Dakota, cut Iowa diagonally in half and go to Patoka, Illinois, by which it would run south to the Gulf, would carry 25 million gallons of Bakken oil a day, some of the most crude and volatile oil on the planet. Um, 25 million gallons when the pipeline breaks is huge. I mean, when Tesoro, when the largest inland oil spill happened near Tioga, North Dakota, 865,200 gallons in September of 2013, what did Tesoro think it was? A bubble moving through the pipe. So they increased pressure. 865,000 gallons, for those of you in the audience, is seven football fields. Tesoro didn't report it. Steve Jensen, when he went out in his farm on his tractor, noticed oil on his tires. Those, I think, are powerful stories. They can, we, we can show evidence to the contrary about how oil makes Taylor Groby's life comfortable and convenient. I woke up in Des Moines, Iowa this morning. I flew out to Boulder, Colorado. I will fly back tomorrow. That way of life, though, we must start saying is morally wrong. Kathleen Dean Moore has a book that just was released last week called Great Tide Rising. And if you don't know her, I urge you to read her. She's Professor Emerita of Philosophy, of philosophy at Oregon State University. And she imagines conversations with the future. And you, you know, told, I am getting white about the temple slowly, but I think of my four nephews who live in Western North Dakota. And I have to say, each day I write, I sit down with the knowledge that the buttes and bluffs I so desperately love will not be there for them. They will be forever altered. The Rocky Mountains aren't carrying rubble by the ancient streams anymore to reconfigure the buttes and bluffs of Western North Dakota. And to me, as a human being, if we have any humanity, we would pull the reins on a process that seeks its profit by compromising the habitability of the planet. I mean, the pallid sturgeon, which lives in the Missouri River watershed, will go extinct in the next few years. Over 10,000 oil, chemical, and salt water spills have emptied into the Missouri River watershed. Now that doesn't quite impact you in Boulder, but it impacts a damn large part of the country that uses it for farming, on down to the Gulf. So I guess, to my point, the literature in here, and why I was glad to have you and Tyler and other people that would hang their hats as philosophers, is to find a type of story, partly because if you go to the man camps, if you go to the Fort Berthold Reservation in North Dakota, people are weeping. And partly because the major narrative is you can't do anything. You cannot regulate when the oil lobbyists have made it, so when an $800,000 fine, like in North Dakota the other week, just was issued, and the oil company says, we will do better land practices, and the industrial commission says, we're only going to charge you $20,000. $800,000 in oil companies is, you know, what I spend on a piece of chocolate. Now you got me going. <laughs> so uh, actually, I shall now go back very quickly and then we'll get the question. On volume two, I feel that volume two is going to be better because in volume two, there will be more attention to literary craft. In volume one, if written out of intense emotion and rage and so on, the stories, especially the fiction, but also the poetry, 
uh, in some of the nonfiction is so constrained. A, a short story that has no movement but can only deliver one clear slogan of a message. That's a handicapped story. That's a story that cannot be all a story can and should be. So rather than saying, I see that this is literature, I thought more about Frank Norris and Upton Sinclair than I thought in a long time. That there's a way that humanity has pr provided you with models of literature that reach people who didn't think they were going to be reached, who were not part of the choir, who were not part of your converts, mm -hmm. and who may live far from the flyover zone, but who would be brought into it. This seems to me, by having so deep a commitment to express the rage and to get it out and to vent it, I think it is not what volume two is going to be in literary art. That to write a short story with um, a cred like opposing cred, mm -hmm. I mean, if you write a short story, Please don't let Craig start writing short stories. I don't want any short stories by the Coloradans for responsible energy development. I, I, I will ban free speech of that, but I don't want any short stories from them. But if they did that, it would be a literary level of this is the point, and you'd better get it. You reader, if you miss my point, I'm just going to, you're not much of a reader because I made the point so clear. So I feel that this volume two is going to have more power because. Uh, uh, William Blake comes to mind as, and was Jerusalem builded here among these dark satanic mills? I mean, what he wrote about the Industrial Revolution is something to look at. Charles Dickens wasn't bad at this. John Dos Passos wasn't. So you're not lacking examples. Can I respond? No. <laughs> no. I, 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 have to, I'll be I, brief, I'm too. I'm going to stick up for you um, when you're done. Well, I, I, so I think part of this is a little unfair, Patty, if I can be honest. Um, part of it, I think, what this is attempting to do is also get a con I mean, we've got these people here as well. We have a, soon we'll enter more of a fully conversation with you all. But it's just a spur of conversation, by which I mean, I, I am thinking, I am thinking, if I am someone who grows up in rural Wyoming, who has a knack for story writing, part of what anthologies do is they give us permission to seek out stories, to develop our own stories. Now, you and I know from um, publishing, I don't have room to include an Upton Sinclair in this book because Upton Sinclair, I don't know the last time you read him, wrote quite lengthy pieces. I, it's um, not his length that I yeah, admire and value. It's yeah. the strategy and the literary craft and so on, but it's not the page numbers that yeah, I celebrate. Yeah, about. well, I think, I think part of this too gets to Pound's earlier idea is yeah, living in the supposed information age, also, we we might be very much staring at the beginning of the end of the human species, and people don't like to think about this. And I, my my the bulwark of how I think is to think if that is true, how do we leave the planet gracefully? And I will just tell you, right now we are not learning how to do that by ransacking every person. And so I think right now, I mean, I think what you're hitting on really well, Patty, is this is a lamentation, this is anger, this is rage, this is also the part of art. I think of Dylan Thomas, do not go gently into that good night. So you have an anthology that does this, and I go, great, I'm mad as hell. And I think others are too. Yes, yeah, but, uh, you actually you still have your level there, but you're but you can okay. use that. Or you can take two. Take um, two. <laughs> I I think, as you yourself said, um, generalizations don't help us. And I think what you just said about this book is a generalization. I, I've I've read every page of this book a couple of times, and I agree with you. There are essays in here that are shrill. Yeah. There are essays in here. There are stories in here that don't have the kind of uh, multiple broader view that would have made them better stories. Um, but there are also stories in here that do, and there are also essays in here that um, are very powerful, I think, in a literary way, and some poems. I mean, I, I thought the, you know, just from a purely literary um, view, I, I, thought, I thought it was up and down, quite honestly. And, and I thought 
that the fact that it was up and down was actually one of its strengths. I thought that there were, you know, ranch wives in here who had never published anything was really super powerful. So it's not always frickin' Upton Sinclair, you know, it's these other voices who actually live in these communities and have had these experiences. And I think then, you know, you have Deborah Marquardt's essay, you have, you have essays by, you know, much more polished writers who know how to be multiple and to know how to create a character and, and make a depth and, you know, speak to people who might not necessarily join the party if everyone's just shrieking at them. Um, and, and so I think you're being too hard on the, the, well, the, the, the anthology, honestly. I think it's, I think it was, a, a, it was one of the things that made it attractive to me that all these different kinds of voices were being included and all these voices who had different sort of agendas and different amount of experience in the literary world. Um, you know, one always wants there to be more essays, poems, or stories that like grab you by the throat in a literary way and trash you and change your mind. But and there were a couple of those. There were some of those. But but I think I think it's actually a strength of this volume that so many different kinds of voices were included, and it wasn't just all the usual suspects um, who you know who were great, but. This essay was trying, or this anthology was trying to do something else than that, and I think to say nobody brought that depth or multiplicity or multifaceted view is not correct. Well, and having uh, taken yeah. the let's find overgeneralization and root it out. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Okay, uh, uh, I, uh, the story of Stain, which is a wonderful title in itself, and it's got many. That's one place in there where I thought, okay, now we're getting, we're getting there. So I don't, I, and I don't know if it's. Volume one is volume, excuse me, volume two is volume one re-edited and, and with more coaching for the farmer's wives or whatever, I mean, I don't know, but it seems that there is a thing that writers have done, which is to reach people who weren't already in their camp and on their side. And I know for Upton Sinclair, he writes the jungle, he wants to call attention to the oppression of the workers, he instead makes everyone worried about the quality of the food that they're eating and they pay no attention to the workers and they get anxious about the food they're eating, so it can go awry. I understand that you've been choosing up to Sinclair, so, well, you could write something that would actually have exactly the, or just a different effect than what you expected. So, okay, so do we have a, a few, um, so we'll, we'll start there and then let after her, yeah. Um, I, I just want to comment about the, Patty, your comments about lack of balance, and, and I haven't read it yet. But what I think is that today we just can't ignore life around us. And the balance is inherent. This is a really necessary call. And this is a really necessary sense of rage that must be expressed in the face of our life where we are bombarded with the commercials, with the fact of personal tensions and guilts about our uh, emotions and related to our uh, greed and energy use. So I think that the balance mm -hmm. is there and that mm -hmm. the strength, uh, if it is there, is necessary. Well, appreciate your remark. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Lynn? Yeah. Uh, if I may, I'd like to make two comments. You started, um, Pam, about um, you wake up in the morning hurting. Uh, feeling sad and, and hurt, and you go to sleep um, sad and hurting. I think that's a very healthy thing. Not to fall into despair, but I think it's very important whether we're talking about fracking or any other injustice, is to feel the hurt. If you don't feel the hurt, you ain't going to do what's necessary. So it's important to, to hurt. and. Uh, and I think you have to reach out, we have to reach out to people who want in um, what needs to be done. I, in my experience, the most powerful human experience is the love that parents feel for their children. And if your kid is sick, you mortgage the house, you do any, you steal bread if you, if you had to, you will do anything. The love that parents for the children is the most powerful human experience, and we don't talk enough. We 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 get we need people to say yes to their children. 
only, they're only going to behave, they're only going to do the right thing if they think about their children and their children's children and their children's care. And, and most of the mo mo movements do not talk about children. Even mm. politics, there's, no, there's nothing, in, there's little things about ch children. But the only way to reach out and get people who ordinarily are not engaged to get them seriously to think about the world that we're creating for, ch for their children and their children's children. Otherwise, there's no opportunity. If you do it with politics, if you do it with literature, it's not going to work because it's not all these good ideas we've known for, uh, forever. Mm -hmm. and, and look where we are. Thinking about children and our children's children is the only, from my perspective, mm -hmm. is the only way we're going to get people who are hesitant to be engaged to be engaged. Any uh, questions or, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, do you want to just carry that over there? Oh, yeah. Is that okay? Thank you. I just um, am responding to the idea that there are some good oil and gas uh, yeah. producers and some that are not so good. But uh, it really concerns me that the industry as a whole has been so secretive about the chemicals that they're injecting into the ground, the effect on our air and water, the fact that a lot of the air pollution that has been put out happens at night and um, it's very difficult to detect. So yeah. that's what right. concerns me. Uh, I might just say that um, it's a micro example maybe, but Noble Energy worked with CSU and real-time monitoring on water quality and opened up their sites. And when there was a um, change in water quality, CSU's team could go right out there. So there are incidents of that. I will also say in this, um, I don't know what, this problematic um, choir harmonic essay in here, but there isn't. What was to me informative and useful was to realize how much the non disclosure of hydraulic fracturing fluids was not industry wide as a great enthusiasm. It was the, um, the service companies who really felt that was their intellectual property that pushed that. I mean, that's what the Halliburton thing, but there are, that was really the service. I mean, that's when you look at who is doing stuff, and this is part of the whole complexity of just the very word industry. There is the operator, there's a bunch of subcontractors. It makes for a very complicated and not uh, necessarily healthy chain of who's in charge. So the pressure on that we won't disclose um, hydraulic fracturing fluid, that was not necessarily the whole industry's cause. And maybe other people who didn't have such a sense of intellectual property and trade secrets were quiet when they should have been speaking out. But it really is the service companies that had that sense of this is our stock and trade and we must protect it. And others in the industry who didn't necessarily have that um, priority were quiet in ways that it was probably unfortunate. So, but there are instances of companies saying quite openly, come observe us. Come observe us and monitor and, and check our water quality. The air issue that you raise, I think, probably is more, more consequential and more important in some ways than... Uh, the more closely monitored water issues, so the air quality stuff and, and what's been observed in uh, Vernal, Utah, and so on. That's quite, that's not anything that anybody can fudge. You had a question. Oh, yeah. yeah, well, here's our magic. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm hearing, uh, okay. I'm really happy to be here. I'm glad that uh, everybody came out. And uh, I just like wanted to acknowledge like all of the tension <laughs> I feel like is in the room, just around the sense that like there's two sides or something, and that like Patty's on one side, and that like you know uh, Pam and like Taylor are on another side, 
And, I'm, and I just sense it in some of the language we're saying, like, this book is either too one-sided, and that one-sided somehow always presumes it's just a two-sided thing or something. Right, it's like, we don't like, it's that. like how we speak of it. And, and I don't think we're asking for that. I don't think yeah. you're asking for, like, let's get a two-sided yeah. thing, right? It's like, let's think about perspective. And that's, like, what I was, that was really what I was excited to come to, to see in the anthology is many perspectives, you know, and, and know that everybody has their own um, and so I just, uh, I just, I just, I am really glad actually though that, um, you know, your Patty is calling for specificity because it's important for us to not overgeneralize the topic um, and say like, there is terrible abuses in this industry and there are people who, you know, have some greater intention, you know, and there are examples of that. And, and so it's like, the, the trouble I think is really in the sense of crisis is like, we all feel like we're kind of in a crisis and like we gotta do something. And we, we is the, the thing that I feel is most general uh, a little bit, like just, especially in, in the brook trout thing, it's like, the, it was so intense, it was so excoriating satire, but like, it said we, 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 and I'm like, this we, who is this we? This we is actually like a white majority like it's 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 a specific it's more specific than a, than everybody you know there are many people who like don't like look away from this and haven't been and have seen yeah. like all yeah. of it um, and so that's maybe some of the specificity around you know who is this book speaking to um, who is it who is it really speaking to I don't know. That's, <laughs> So yeah. I haven't read it yet. I'm really excited to. Are you Are you a student or? What's your name? Uh. Oh, don't, don't, well, no, hang on. Don't, no, 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 not this. I. You look like someone I know. Is well, why I'm asking that. Oh, really? Uh, well, okay. Well, just fine. just tell us if you're a student for right now, and then I'm chat afterwards. I'm not a student. I am. Uh, I live in Boulder. Um, I'm from North Dakota, as it turns out. Right? So it's not a possibility that we like like cross paths maybe one hang day. On. We'll talk. That's, we'll a, okay. that's a funny thing. Anyway, no, that's okay. why. Well, thank you. It was a challenge. Actually, I just have a quick comment to to some of this too. Um, I think too, I mean, this is the interesting work of editing and what you're trying to shape and hopefully shape or see what comes across your path. Um, I, I guess to your, I'm still chewing over what you're saying, Patty, and I can't I can get that. I mean, I'm Midwestern Lutheran. I like everyone to get along. You know, we like have church basement potlucks and stuff. Um, some casseroles, have some casseroles. Part of me, though, what I'm also thinking on is not what's so bad about, but just also like, when, I guess part of my perspective is when is it also necessary to say that there are just people hurting? And, and sometimes you need a volume that says, I'm hurting and I'm angry. And not that that's what this fever, I, I don't, maybe it's because I'm so deeply biased, because of course I am, I'm a writer. Um, but to me, there's a, there's more of maybe that spirit, I guess, is what I, I'm, I'm not, I don't think the anthology, I hope it wasn't, wasn't trying to go as broad and bring as many people in so much as trying to say, there are elements at work in the world here, and what are some stories that help those of us who feel like our places have been hurt, sacrificed, whatever term you want, um, to say, we're also not alone in this. Um, so that's maybe just a broader comment on that. Well, the expanded version in the High Country News has this passage. I have listened, this is me uh, speaking, I have listened as a veteran of the oil and gas business declared that his industry should play close attention to the lessons from the history of extractive industries, especially mining, in order to learn the wisdom of exercising foresight and precaution in anticipation of environmental legacies. And I have confronted the fatigue and frustration of people deeply concerned about the well-being of their home communities who must shoehorn their activism into schedules already packed with the obligations of work and family. And here, Landis, next sentence is for you. I believe that empathy for their circumstances, especially with their concerns for the safety of their children, is within the emotional reach of any leader in the oil and gas industry and meaningful actions could result from that willingness to venture outside the circles of the like-minded and to reckon with the experience of people who have been unsettled in the many means of that world by oil and gas development. So, 
Um, I just wanted to say one thing to you, um, and and well, I mean to everyone, but 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 to your point about that book draft essay, um, and I just just as you know the English teacher in the room, I, I just want to say that that the strategy of that essay it does exactly, in my opinion, what Patty's asking for, because the the we is the the we is purposefully non-specific because. She's saying all of us, I mean, even me, who, who wakes up in the morning and thinks about the destruction of the earth and goes to bed at night, thinks about the destruction of the earth. I, I have times when I'm, you know, getting on a plane and feeling happy, <laughs> you know, or whatever. I mean, we all do. So we are all, I mean, I feel like, like I, like what, what that essay was saying to me, you know, that, that's, a, that's a literary stance. It's a, it's a trope. She was, she was creating every person so that we could all say yeah man I don't think about fracking when I get on that 747 because I get to go teach in France for three weeks you know do I I don't think you know <laughs> she was she was caught like we all she was saying like everyone here has has doesn't want to think about fracking because you know and, and and so I just wanted to say like like rather than that essay like falling down literarily because it was too general or it wasn't specific or whatever. I, I, just, I just wanted to respectfully disagree and say I thought that essay stance and the sort of ironic, you know, satirical twist and that person she made out of all of us was really skillful and because anyone could find themselves in those 10, somewhere in those 10. And, and, and so I just think that essay is a really good example of how the book does succeed literarily because no matter who you are, I mean, even if you're the CEO of Shell, you know, <laughs> you know, and I don't, I don't know enough about, you know, the CEO of Shell. Patty knows way more about oh, him I than, than, than I do. <laughs> so I don't know enough about him to speak about him, but I do know enough about literary stance to speak with authority about that. And like, if, if the CEO read that piece, you know, not that he would necessarily, but he would find himself in it. You know, you could, anyone could find themselves in that piece. And that was the strategy of the piece, the, the big we that we are all a part of, whether we want to be or not, even when we think we're not being. So I think that essay is very smart. Um, and, and how it makes us look at ourselves. I mean, I don't think anyone, well, I shouldn't say that. Um, I am. I don't feel in any way self-righteous about this issue because I, I have right now. I am driving a, a small, but an SUV because I have 350 pounds of dog to cart around. That's just the fact of my life, you know. But I didn't have children, so I didn't have any petroleum diapers, and I keep my house at 65. So you know, we we all make these trades all the time, and you know, we're going to have to, as Taylor says, make bigger trades and. You know, so I don't feel in any way immune to criticism about my own carbon right. footprint right. Pr print or anything like that. But I don't think that means we can't say, hey, you know, hey, let's talk about benzene. You know, let's talk about, let's talk about the fact that, you know, these people are lying. Not that everyone's lying, but that these people are lying, you know. And, and so, so anyway, that, that, that was all. Hmm. I could go on and on. Well, okay, so the question that, um, well, we're actually moving very soon to the, to the book signing section. Uh, could you be very uh, sharp and pointed? Yeah. yeah. I want to thank the editors for, uh, for providing us with uh, voices, uh, perhaps to inspire. Uh, if I want a well-balanced account, uh, I will read law review articles as a civil rights attorney of 40 years. Uh, this this gives inspiration, and I think that's the purpose. And if it's criticized as being another, uh, perhaps uh, not balanced, the Zola's Jacuz, so be it, because it provides it provides a niche that's important to arm individuals to go on for the next day uh, to wake up and, and face the realities that we have. So I, I and I think that's the purpose of literature, at least one of the purposes. I don't want to generalize. <laughs> no, none of us are ever going to do that again in our lives. We're just going to I'm gonna get you know, cats on a hot here. stove when it comes to that. Oh, Jane, you, you wanted? Just a real quick, um, what slow learners we are about the extractive industries. Oh my god, the mining industry. Talk about greed, deception, cover up. How many hundreds of years have we been letting them get away? So we need to stand up right now and say enough. And 
presumably you might want as many people considering that option, and that's where I still am not going to yield too much ground on the what might happen to think about how to bring people into consideration. Uh, and one thing I will say, and this is going to be a terrible originalization, and I will just be humiliated when it turns out I'm wrong, I don't think there's any humor in this thing. And not even Bill Rohrbach? I don't know. I, I don't think there's very much humor. And I want to say that as a widow, 11 years ago, I know that even under terrible circumstances, things still are funny. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not saying, oh, this is should be turned into a light top. I'm not saying that in the least. But it seems to me so solemn and so missing that element of how we deal with life's troubles with that strange part of our brain that even in tragic circumstances can, can deal that. So that seems to me, volume two, which I'm still holding on to, might have some of that humor. And then I know that, um, I, I, I know that I'm quite comic in this, that I really do steer by friendship and by personal conversation. And I figured that because Pam and I are going to do a program, which we've never done, but we talked about it years ago, and we know it would be very excellent, we will have a group of people and the audience will uh, choose words, and they'll say like, they'll say like um, ironing board. Ironing board, and and she will have a funny story about ironing boards, and I will have a funny story about it because we have lived our lives looking for funny things, and funny things have happened to us. Okay. So the next time you see Pam Houston, we'll be doing this program where you just get to say Chihuahua, and we go, yeah. Oh no, Chihuahuas! Did I tell you about the time? <laughs> so that is going to be the next time we're in together because humor has been a wonderful element of our interactions. And so my, I, I didn't know Taylor, but he made a bad move in contacting me a few years ago to be a, a contributor here, and he's living with the consequences of that. So I just figured that we would probably get into this evening, and it might have some of the, uh, I don't know, I mean, since I've said it's not just two sides, but there may have been moments where we seem to be enacting a play in which there were two sides, but I also knew that the friendship thing would take us through this. So, so ladies and gentlemen, we are now going to have a Festival of Consumerism, where for $20 you may buy this book, and you should not think for a second about the trees produced for the... I think there's a recycled book. note at the back. Yeah, so you need to think about Guilt the trees. Free. So thank you so much for your company tonight and for your comments and thoughts, and we'll be hanging out.